Elizabeth. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Husby, and I am the campaign coordinator for the Protect Walker Ridge campaign. I would like to thank you all for joining us in our second session in a series of Zoom webinars highlighting the unique features of Walker Ridge. I'm guessing by now that many of you are familiar with Zoom, but I would like to take a moment to review the features just in case you're not. Please know that the features to interact with us are located at the bottom of the screen. If you were to use the chat feature, please know it will go directly to Elizabeth, who is helping us run the session, and not to our presenter or to the rest of the viewers. So if you have any questions during the pres presentation that you would like to ask, please put them in the question and answer feature, which is located again at the bottom of the screen. We will have time at the end of the presentation to answer some of these questions for you. Have you ever wondered what kind of critters might be hiding or roaming amid the unique landscape that is Walker Ridge in the eastern part of Northern California's coast range? Tonight, we will be getting to know the natural neighborhood with conservationist Andre Sanchez. Andre is the San Joaquin Valley organizer for the California Wilderness Coalition. Andre received a Bachelor's of Science in Wildlife, Fish, and Conservation Biology from UC Davis in 2014 and then went on to work for several state and federal agencies, including conducting aquatic restoration in Yosemite National Park. After gaining perspective from his work experiences, Andre returned to academia to pursue a master's of science in natural resources with a watershed management emphasis at Humble State University. Tonight's presentation is entitled The Reptiles and Amphibians of Lake and Calusa County's Walker Ridge. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Andre Sanchez. Andre, I'm gonna turn this over to you at this time. Hello, good evening, good night to everybody. Um, thank you all for joining us and I appreciate you taking the time uh, to yeah, be here today. Um, I really hope that I get to you know, provide some information and insight as to some of the um, amphibians and reptiles that are present on Walker Ridge. Um, I will give the caveat that there is a, a longer list of species that uh, arguably have their, their range uh, make, that makes them potentially present on Walker Ridge. Um, so I'm only going to give a handful of them, um, a couple of them that are definitely a little bit more common and a couple of them that are of special um, consideration. Um, but yeah, thank you again for joining us and I will get going with that said. So again, yeah, I'm going to be talking about the reptiles and amphibians um, of Lake and Calusa County's Walker Ridge. Um, I didn't do it. Okay. Once I am the San Joaquin Valley organizer uh, with the California Wilderness Coalition, aka Cow Wild. Um, and I'm originally from San Joaquin Valley um, and born and raised here. And now I'm back here uh, residing um, under this position and title. And I have an affiliation with a couple of organizations. But tonight I'm here as a wearing my wildlife hat and particularly as a, the organizer and wildlife uh, person for Cow Wild. Um, that said, Cow Wild um, has a mission to protect and restore the state's wildest natural landscapes and watersheds um, on public lands. Um, and as you can see a map here, um, there's luckily quite a few different landscapes that we help protect across California. Um, one of them being Walker Ridge um, that we're trying to help continue to, uh, to protect um, with, you know, special protections. Um, you know, and I'm going to kind of give you guys a, a little bit more of a tour as if we were going up, you know, so maybe you guys would be able to see some of these species as we would go along the way. Um, before I go on too much further, um, just in case folks don't know where Walker Ridge is, I'm going to be pointing out where that is. Um, so hopefully it gives you a point of clarity and uh, yeah, context. Um, so Walker Ridge is within the snow or the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument, um, which is in Northern California. Um, so just northeast of uh, Clear Lake. So it Walker Ridge itself um, actually kind of borders on Calusa and Lake County, as I kind of said in the title. Um, and as you can see on the red, uh, it kind of goes up a ways. Um, you can follow along Walker Ridge Road, um, as it's called, and it takes you up towards the Indian Valley Reservoir. Uh, but more than just being the ridge itself and being you know, on the boundary of these counties, um, it is also the traditional territories of the Patwin people. Um, so I just wanted to uh, make sure I mentioned that. Um, you know, because we all re reside on the traditional and ancestral territories of indigenous folk. Um, another quick point of clarification. Um, this is, I guess, one of my, uh, I'm gonna say quite pet peeves, but just, you know, some people uh, aren't as familiar with some certain terminology uh, with respect to reptiles and amphibians. 
Um, so herpetology um, is actually the study of reptiles and amphibians. So, you know, just for like you, uh, for flower folks or, and studying flora and whatnot, there's a uh, botany, um, there's herpetology. And more than that, um, you know, herpetofauna, um, as it are there referred, um, or herps for shorthanding, um, just like, you know, uh, flora is an interchangeable term for flowers um, and other species. Um, herps and herpetofauna are interchangeable, um, particularly um, with respect to reptiles and amphibians of a region or a specific time period. Um, and one reason I really want to talk about reptiles and amphibians and that I find them uh, pretty fascinating um, is that reptiles and amphibians are what can be considered bioindicators. And for those who might not know what bioindicators are, um, a better, longer descriptive name is biological indicator. And ultimately, it's a canary in the coal mine um, that is uh, used to be able to tell what the landscape or the ecosystem is kind of the state of it is. Um, and it can give uh, quanti quantifiable um, data um, with respect to responses in the environment, um, if there's any stressors or any kind of uh, significant changes. Uh, but more than that, with respect to reptiles and amphibians, as I'll go into a little bit more, um, it can give a temporal uh, component and can give temporal context because um, reptiles and amphibians, but all bioindicators as well, um, you know, they go through different life uh, spans and different portions of their, their life cycle. Um, so a bioindicator as a whole um, is a great tool to utilize on based on you know, biological and ecological perspectives. Um, with respect to reptiles and amphibians, um, this is a, a quote from a EPA a study from uh, the state of Washington. Um, where they pretty much point out the fact that, you know, with changing landscapes, changing hydrological regimes, you know, such as streams and rivers and whatnot, um, and overall just uh, changes in species presence with respect to native and non-native species, um, you know, amphibians particularly, um, but reptiles as well, can give a pretty good insight as to uh, what the landscape is doing or how the landscape is. Um, so henceforth why I mentioned uh, bio, uh, bio indicators and why reptiles and amphibians are great bio indicators. And a little bit more in terms of amphibians specifically, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, with respect to lifespan and parts of life cycle, um, you know, amphibians specifically, as their name, um, their broad name kind of mentions, they are amphibious. So they spend part of their life cycle on land and spend part of their life cycle in the water. Um, so with respect to other important parts of why are, they are great bioindicators, um, they have permeable skin, which allows them to uh, which allows oxygen and uh, other gases to move through their, uh, their body um, freely. And, you know, it can absorb also, unfortunately, um, and concentrate uh, toxins and other uh, chemicals uh, within their fatty tissues. With respect to reptiles specifically, uh, they, are, they can be great bioindicators, um, particularly in areas that are, have amphibians uh, occur less frequently. Um, or in areas that have dry and seasonality or that are, are dry or have seasonality to them. Um, you know, again, be, just in case there aren't as amphibians as present. Um, more than that, um, and reptiles have been um, thought to be pretty sensitive to pesticides um, and other chemicals. Um, so, you know, going a little bit further than that, they uh, can accumulate certain kind of uh, toxins and chemicals as well, particularly because they tend to be active predators. So, uh, you know, they're part of the food chain. So they accumulate, uh, you know, any chemicals or pesticides or whatnot um, in the system uh, more readily. Now, with that said, um, you know, one of the bioindicators, in my opinion, um, that is an amphibian, and this is, you know, hopefully what you guys are here a little bit more for, um, is some of the species that occur on Walker Ridge. Um, and the first one I'm gonna get started with is the California newt, um, Tariqa terosa. Um, specifically the subspecies uh, Terosa, um, so Tarika Terosa Terosa, um, for those of you um, who want the full scientific name. Um, but the California newt um, is endemic to California, so that means they're only located in the state of California, uh, for better and worse. Uh, they are also a species of special concern in Southern California, uh, arguably, you know, because there's a lot of wildland um, urban uh, changes that uh, occur down there. Um, but just as readily, you know, they could become a species of special concern in Northern California. Um, and, you know, if they're losing habitat uh, in places such as Walker Ridge or in other locations, 
uh, you know, that could very easily go down a slippery slope. Uh, but going back to the species itself a little bit more, they are found along uh, the counties of California, uh, the coastal counties of California, excuse me, and in southern the southern Sierra Nevada. Um, one important little uh, interesting fact that I always think is pretty amazing about them is that they are actually toxic, um, not necessarily to humans, um, though, uh, you know, I wouldn't test it, <laughs> um, but they secrete a toxin through their skin um, when they're adults. Uh, when they're younger, they do not. Um, so generally they get preyed upon um, when they're younger a little bit more than what it, they do as adults. But, uh, you know, one thought is that they kind of are in an arms race um, with some of their predators, which is what uh, ultimately make them more, making them more and more toxin, toxic as time has gone on. Um, but that said, yeah, you know, an interesting little fact, um, you know, some people men have mentioned to me that if you have some kind of like cut or open wound on your hand and you get the toxin in you, you know, it might feel a little weird, um, but like I said, I wouldn't test it, but you know, they are toxic to some of their predators. Um, and a little bit more in terms of the California newt, um, you know, as I mentioned, they are amphibious um, and with respect to a little bit more of their habitat that they might be present in along Walker Ridge, they are found in a uh, wet forest. Um, so quite not necessarily wet forest as often in Walker Ridge, but oak woodlands. Um, so oak forest, chaparral and rolling grasslands, which uh, are fairly common along the Walker Ridge area. Um, one quick uh, sidebar, they are commonly confused with the rough skin newt. And as you can see in this image here, um, they're pretty close in resemblance um, with a number of other potential identifying factors. One of them is it that does distinguish them is on the right being uh, Tarika terosa, the, newt, the California newt, as opposed to the rough skin newt. Um, they have a little bit more of an orange coloration above their eye, uh, eyeballs, um, whereas the rough skin newt tends to be a little bit more gray. Um, but like I said, there's a couple other uh, factors, but this is one of the more readily distinguishable ones. Um, so, you know, just throwing that out there for in case anyone was in, uh, wondering if it was uh, also known as the rough skin newt, um, it is not. Um, they're two separate species, uh, but they are fairly similar. Um, you know, when Tarika terosa tends to unfortunately um, sometimes have that uh, rough uh, pattern to its uh, upper body uh, oftentimes, but again, it is a separate species. Um, moving on, I wanted to actually share um, something that I thought was pretty amazing as I described it, um, you know, to other folks in the past. I personally think they move a little bit kind of like mermaids underwater, but that's just the way I've kind of perceived it. Um, and I want to share some of these videos, um, you know, with their mating uh, patterns, um, you know, demonstrating their mating clusters. Um, so hopefully you guys find it as entertaining and informational as I have. Yeah. Are you not playing now? Oh, go back. Sorry about that. changes that are related to hormones used by humans themselves. I've been studying newts for literally decades, about 50 years to be exact. When it's time for the breeding season, hormones start changing them. It drives the males to the water. Their tail starts growing. Their arms get stronger for holding on to the female. When they're both in the water, the male is attracted by the scent of the male of a um, ripe female. He then grabs onto her, holds onto her behind her armpits and begins moving with her and rubbing his chin on the top of her head. And the chin has a secretion which excites her. And this may go on for minutes or even an hour. It can look violent to us and part of it may be planned because the female wants to pick the biggest, strongest, toughest male and he's got to impress her. So she doesn't readily accept him until he's shown his stuff. When she's sufficiently stimulated, he lets go of her. He begins walking along the bottom of the pond and she'll follow him. And as he walks, he deposits little packages of sperm and she walks over and picks them up and goes off 
and lays her egg, and they get fertilized in the female as they pass out of her body. We all so that's that video, and I'll show one other quick one. Um, just kind of show a little bit more of their, their movement and whatnot. What if you drowned? <laughs> I guess she's not really ex Oh, she got some oh, water. Oh, you got her. I wonder how long it'll take for them to figure out. I know. Oh, they went into privacy. So yeah, I just figured I'd share a little bit of that. Hopefully you guys uh, found that entertaining. Um, but yeah, moving on to another species um, that's uh, common along Walker Ridge um, is the California alligator lizard. Um, Algaria multicarinata and subspecies multicarinata being the common one there. Um, as I mentioned here, there are two uh, subspecies um, and the one here arguably called California or forested, um, which is the multicarinata uh, subspecies. Uh, this species tend to, uh, tends to occur in uh, grasslands, open forest areas, chaparral areas, um, and is common in oak woodlands as well. A little bit more on the alligator lizard. Um, you know, I think it's a pretty cool um, organism because of how uh, long it can, can be. Um, its tail lengths can be twice the length of its body um, if it hasn't broken off or hasn't, um, you know, dropped it and regenerated it. Um, so if there's one that hasn't been uh, disturbed too often, um, it'll look fairly, uh, you know, like a lengthy animal. Um, and, you know, some people might find it a little intimidating, but um, I personally think they're they're pretty uh, you know, cute um, in a way. Um, with respect to their name, the common portion of their name, the alligator, alligator lizard, it's arguably in reference to their the back, back um, and their belly scales being reinforced by bones, um, which is uh, a trait that is found in actual alligators. Um, so you know, just a quick little tidbit up there. Uh, moving on to the next species, um, on a point out the California king snake, um, Lampropeltis californiae. Um, so it's found in forested areas, in woodland areas, chaparral areas, grasslands, um, and you know other areas as well as uh, you know brushy suburban areas. Um, in my opinion, it's a beautiful colorated uh, snake species. Um, you know, and you know surprisingly, even though it has a broad range, um, I don't think it's that common of a species to see, um, like many other um, herps. You know, they, they very easily uh, avert humans, um, but, you know, in my time in, out in the outdoors, uh, you know, I've only seen less than a handful of them myself. A um, couple other facts about the king snake is they can be highly variable in appearance. Um, you know, they are a constricting snake, so they're in the colubrids, um, but they are not venomous, um, you know, quite the opposite. They are actually immune to venom um, from rattlesnakes and they will prey on other snakes. Um, which is arguably part of the reason they called the king uh, snake um, in their name. Um, but with respect to rattlesnakes a little bit more, they actually have been found to imitate the, de the defensive tactics that rattlesnakes have. Um, so coiling up and then, you know, having their tail um, rattle back and forth. Um, so, you know, from afar, there's a chance that, you know, if they, if they haven't been scared away uh, by, you know, by a person and they do happen to see one, uh, you know, they might try to act like a rattlesnake, but they aren't a rattlesnake. Um, you know, they definitely have many distinguishing features. And, you know, as you can see in the coloration, uh, don't really look like a rattlesnake, but, you know, might try to intimidate you in that way. Uh, moving on to a couple of the other herps, um, you know, here's a, one that's a, a little bit more of a special status, um, which is the foothill yellow-legged frog, uh, Rana boilei. Um, and it's found around um, rocky streams and rivers um, and other rocky substrates. Um, it is uh, found also in like open sunny banks along streams and rivers, excuse me, um, and in forested areas and chaparral and woodland, um, such as might be common along Walker Ridge. Um, unfortunately, their populations are declining across their range, um, and that has led to them being a federal species of concern, special uh, concern, and a California state endangered species. Um, so there are efforts underway, um, you know, to try to figure out what's going on, but, you know, the populations are still declining, um, you know, 
as many uh, frogs are, um, you know, not just declining, but uh, on the positive note, I think they, again, they're, they're a pretty charismatic uh, species. Um, another charismatic species that uh, is arguably pretty common, but uh, as I'll get to in a, in a minute, um, are in decline as well, um, is the Sierra tree frog, Sudacris uh, Sierra, or Sierra, sorry, it's a typo on that one. Um, but as you can see here, um, they're the more common tree frog that you can see uh, across a broad range of the state. Um, you know, on the map depicted on the right, you can see the distribution is in orange. Um, so they're pretty, uh, they're distributed pretty, uh, yeah, pretty broadly across the state. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they unfortunately have been uh, noted that their, their populations are declining by some folks. Um, but going uh, back to a little bit of it, about them, um, you know, they are common in a different uh, variety of habitats as well. Um, you know, uh, particularly um, sometimes even outside of uh, water areas um, or water bodies during the breeding season. So they can actually be pretty, pretty far away um, from certain areas. I've definitely found some in like rocky outcrops where I didn't see any water nearby, surprisingly. Um, so these are, uh, you know, pretty cute little, uh, you know, animals. Um, as I mentioned uh, a couple times now, um, their species, uh, the species is uh, noted to be in decline, but there's uh, more evidence that needs to be, um, you know, collected with respect to that. Um, interesting little fact, um, and actually I'll mention this a little bit more in depth in a second, um, is they tend to be the uh, tree frog with the typical uh, frog rippet that has been used many times over in Hollywood movies or shows or whatnot. Um, but that was more under their old uh, name which is Hyla regilla. Um, and going back to actually this map really quick, um, Hyla regilla was arguably dispersed or distributed throughout all of California. And then it uh, got renamed and uh, re-identified as three separate species, um, which includes uh, Sudacris uh, sierra, so the Sierra tree frog, which was also the uh, Pacific tree frog, um, which as you saw on the map a second ago was more on the northwestern uh, tip of California. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's been the typical frog that they use the river town from. Um, and in, by some folks, it's considered a keystone species, um, particularly because it is a common prey um, organism for several other predators, um, you know, in its different habitat uh, locations. Um, so, you know, kind of going back to it being a biological indicator, you know, if the prey, um, you know, numbers are decreasing in the system, um, you know, you're going to have less overall predators as well, um, which means that you're going to have a, you know, decrease in all organisms. So, you know, the fact that in some locations, some, some folks are claiming that the, there's been declines of these species, um, you know, it's, a, it's an unfortunate situation. Um, but, you know, I guess on the, on the productive end, it's, uh, it being a biological uh, indicator, it kind of shows that, you know, we, there's something wrong um, and that's a little bit more ready to readily able to identify. Um, now the next species I wanna briefly point out is the Northwestern fence lizard. Um, it's a pretty common uh, herp. I think many folks are, have encountered at some point in their life, particularly those that might've lived in California. Um, this is Scalopris occidentalis, um, subspecies occidentalis, um, which particularly in this case, making it the Northwestern fence lizard as opposed to just the common uh, quote unquote uh, Western fence lizard. Um, but it's found in a variety of uh, habitats as well, um, particularly in sunny areas, um, including like woodlands and grasslands, uh, chaparral forest, and you know even sometimes near waterways. Um, and as I mentioned, many folks might have come across it because it even occurs in suburban areas, um, you know, in people's backyards or whatnot. If they happen to just you know be adjacent to where the species previously was distributed, um, as you can see, it's a uh, distributed pretty broadly um, as a whole species throughout the state, um, but the subspecies occidentalis um, is more of a north, you know, northern species overall. Um, one pretty cool uh, fact about the fence lizard um, is that it's an important species in California, um, arguably, um, because they have a protein in their blood, um, which has been found to kill the bacteria in ticks that can cause Lyme disease. Um, so, you know, some folks have argued that they might contribute to part of the reason why uh, California has lower rates of Lyme disease. Um, there's still lots of research that's being conducted and collected about it, 
But as you can see, you know, um, on, from this picture, uh, you know, the ticks are, aren't um, uncommon amid, amid the species, um, you know, to attach to. Um, but that said, you know, it doesn't really bother them as far as I know. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a pretty cool little fact to, to think that a species could cure, you know, a, a disease. And then there's more um, health related uh, research that's being conducted in order to try to get context as to, you know, why that might actually be the case, you know, aside from just, you know, at the basic level, knowing that it's a protein, they're trying to understand the mechanism in order to try to help uh, treat uh, Lyme disease uh, itself. Um, so, and I apologize if I uh, ran through the, some of those uh, uh, species a little quick. Like I said, I just wanted to make sure I uh, mentioned a couple handful of them. Uh, but the key takeaway I wanted to mention was, you know, some of the different species that you might encounter along Walker Ridge, um, and particularly that, you know, reptiles and amphibians, herps as a whole, um, are great bioindicators. Um, in my opinion, herps are friends and are readily present along and near Walker Ridge. Um, you know, some of these species that I pointed out are definitely, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, sorry about that. Um, yeah, some of the species are uh, readily, uh, you know, found along Walker Ridge. Um, so, you know, if anyone has an opportunity to, you know, go out there to adventure, um, you know, hopefully you'll be able to stumble upon one of these that hopefully you can now identify. Um, you know, while this wasn't a, you know, identification presentation uh, per se, um, hopefully it gives you a little bit of context of the different species that are present um, along Walker Ridge. Um, and with that, um, excuse me, I wanted to kind of transition as to, you know, part of the reason I'm, uh, again, part of this effort um, and, you know, giving this presentation, um, as some of you might know, or some of you not uh, might be aware, Walker Ridge is under uh, threat um, by a wind energy project. Um, as you can see here in the red box, um, you know, that, essentially is the entire corridor that is uh, Walker Ridge itself. Um, as I pointed out in the map earlier, um, you know, that there's a, the Walker, Walker Ridge Road follows up along that way. And unfortunately, you know, there's, um, you know, this, this project that's threatening this area. Um, but with that said, um, I will kind of uh, hand it over to Sarah to talk about the project a little bit more. Um, and I can also be answering questions, um, you know, if, if uh, we have a little more time about, for that. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Andre. I really appreciate the very informative presentation. We're going to give folks who are viewing a couple of minutes to put their questions that they may have into the question and answer section of Zoom, and we'll get to those in just a minute. Um, while we wait, um, I would like to let our viewers know that our next Walker Ridge Zoom webinar is scheduled for Wednesday, November 10th at 6 p.m. Our, um, I'm going to be presenting that evening along with Nick Jensen of the California Native Plant Society. We'll be discussing the history of Walker Ridge and the wind energy development project that is threatening the area and the five ways that you can protect Walker Ridge. To register for the event or to learn more about the Protect Walker Ridge campaign, you can go to the California Native Plant Society's Protect Walker Ridge campaign website. Also, if you're interested in helping out immediately, we have a petition at change.org. Our Protect Walker Ridge Coalition is advocating to make the entire Walker Ridge area an area of critical and environmental concern. That's a specific designation that is done through the Bureau of Land Management. Our petition is requesting that the Bureau of Land Management honor and review the two petitions of area of critical environmental concern that had been made by the Nat California Native Plant Society over the last nine years and to designate and protect this spe special area. So I'm going to go and check real quick to see if we have some questions. I don't have any questions at this moment. Oh, I do have a question. Is the California sa slender salamander found at Walker Ridge? You might be on mute. <laughs> Excuse me about that. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yes, it uh, has been uh, previously recorded near Walker Ridge, um, not on Walker Ridge proper, but just, you know, outside of the Ridgeway, you could say. Um, but its species range has been, uh, you know, uh, estimated to be included in Walker Ridge as well. And so the fact that it has occurred, you know, just down the way from the ridge itself, it's more than likely that the slender salamander has been, uh, or it could be found there. 
Sure. So I have another question that came up. Do you have a favorite herpetology animal that is in the Walker Ridge area? Uh, yeah, I think I kind of pointed it out. I mean, as you might have noticed, you know, I emphasize the, the newt uh, pretty much or pretty deeply. Um, I think personally that they're really cute. Um, you know, I, I just, yeah, I, I just can't get over how interesting of animals they are. You know, they move so uh, gracefully um, in the water. Um, they have really interesting uh, mating behaviors. Um, the fact that they have, uh, you know, very uh, low um, activity uh, defense mechanism, which is their toxin, um, is very interesting. And the fact that they have been uh, in an arms race with many of their predators just makes them a really interesting organism to me. Um, I mean, truth be told, all herps are pretty awesome, but, you know, I think the newts are pretty amazing um, themselves. Is there any specific species up on Walker Ridge that you're aware of that is more threatened than others? To my knowledge, um, I would say that the yellow leg or the mountain yellow legged frog um, is one of the ones that is more likely threatened um, because, again, it's the uh, populations are declining um, and, you know, it's listed or considered um, listed under California law and, uh, you know, species of special concern at the federal level. Um, so I would say that was would be one of the species um, of consideration uh, for your question. Um, yeah, I would say that's a primary one. Great. Well, that actually wraps up the questions that we have for this evening. If you are looking at the chat box, Elizabeth has put in there some information from you all that you can see on how you can register for our upcoming webinar, again, which is on Wednesday, November 10th at 6 p.m. And then also Elizabeth has included in there the link to you to go to the change.org petition to sign. Once again, I would like to thank Andre Sanchez for donating his time this evening and for the great presentation about the amphibians and reptiles of Walker Ridge. And I wanna thank you all for joining us and having an interest in Walker Ridge and being supporters of this great cause. Thank you very much and have a great evening.